The Pure Blood Pretense by Murky Blue Matter, Chapter 7. The next morning, Rigel took the shortcut through the dueling knight's tapestry on the fourth floor on her way to the owlery. She made her way carefully in the pitch blackness, her footsteps unnaturally quiet. She was just wondering if there were muffling charms in effect on the stairs when a solid body going to opposite direction crashed into her. Whoa! A voice shouted in her ear as they fell, tumbling back down the five steps she just climbed. When they landed in the small space between the back of the tapestry and the first stair, the boy crushing her lower legs groaned and called, Oi! Gred! There's someone else in here! Lumos! A second voice came from halfway up the steps. The light from the wand, held high above its owner's head, revealed her attackers, the Weasley twins. She would recognise their hair, the same shade as Ron's, anywhere. The one on the floor beside her relinquished his squatting rights to her legs and stood. When he offered a hand, she took it. He hauled her up cheerfully, making a show of checking her over for imaginary dirt. All right there? he asked. Can't tell if that's muck or just the colour of your hair in this light. "'Course he's not!' the other one bounded down the stairs to get a look at her in his wand light. "'Terribly sorry, chap. Forge here has always been the clumsy one.' Rigel opened her mouth, but the other one cut across her. "'Don't believe him, good fellow. I'm not the clumsy one. Gred is the forgetful one.' The twin who'd helped her up grinned conspiratorially. "'He forgot that I'm the pretty one, and he's the clumsy one, which is why I usually go first down these stairs, and therefore why I was the one who ran into you.' Rigel nodded in a way that conveyed more acceptance than understanding. "'Unfortunately, Forge is also the rude one,' the other said. "'Which is the one who will actually introduce himself?' Rigel asked. "'Because where I'm from we exchange names before throwing people down a flight of stairs.' They exchanged grins that could devil a dozen eggs, and Rigel decided not to believe them before they even spoke. "'I'm Fred, maybe. George, likewise!' "'And we're the Weasley twins,' they chorused. "'Never heard of you!' "'Rigel stayed absolutely deadpan. "'They threw their heads back in identical laughs. "'A kindred spirit,' George crowed. "'He jokes! An heir!' "'Fred ruffled her hair in a spurt of elation. "'It turned out there was dirt in it, "'and when Rigel sneezed, they laughed again. "'We must know the name of our prodigy,' George declared. "'Indeed, who is it that possesses the wherewithal to find this passage and the sense of humour to refrain from cursing us for our clumsiness? Fred asked. I'm Rigel, she said, a little unnerved to be standing in a secret passageway she wasn't expecting anyone else to even know about with the two most infamous troublemakers in the school, and I don't know any curses. Rigel, Rigel, Fred glanced questioningly at his twin. Doesn't ring a bell? You sure that's your name? George asked. Don't feel too bad. I forget mine's Forge all the time. Silly, I'm Forge, Fred said. I told you he was the forgetful one. Actually, it was your brother who told me that you were the forgetful one, Rigel said, he, back when he was Forge instead of you. Ah, yes. Fred looked confused for a moment. Well, I guess he was right. Though, of course, if it was Fred who told you that, it might as well have been me. I'm Fred most of the time. Rigel didn't even try to make sense of that. "'Clever little thing. You a Ravenclaw, Rigel?' George asked. He peered at her robes, and Rigel realised she hadn't put on her green and silver tie that morning. She'd been planning on grabbing it before breakfast. "'I'm a Slytherin!' She expected them to recoil, as if they were the snakes, but their grins grew even wider, making them look manic in the dim wand light. Rigel thought she had good reason to be concerned. "'Now I know why your mud-coloured hair looks familiar.' George said, "'Your serious black son, Arcturus.' "'And we thought we had trouble with names,' Fred shook his head sadly. "'You've gone and given yourself a whole new one, if only you knew.' "'Rigel is my middle name,' she said. "'But yes, Sirius Black is my father.' Fred grabbed her hands and began swinging them in restless excitement. "'Is it true he once performed a conditional transfiguration on the main stair that turned it into a slide every time someone said homework while standing on it?' "'Actually,' That was James Potter, Rigel said, amazed that they had even heard of that prank. The Marauders had published a book of jokes and pranks a few years back, which had been a huge success at Zonko's joke shop, but as far as she knew, that one wasn't in it. My dad was the one who charmed the mirrors in the bathrooms on the first, third and fifth floors to spit juice at anyone who tried to walk out without washing their hands. 
the twins stared, their cobalt blue eyes as wide and bright as galleons. That was him! There's a mirror on the fifth floor that still does that! Fred exclaimed. The marauders are our heroes, George explained. Fred bounced on his toes as he nodded. The marauder line at Zonko's always has the best prank supplies. Our parents actually knew them when they were seventh years at Hogwarts and the marauders were just really noisy firsties. Who'd have thought then they'd go on to become legends? George shook his head in apparent amazement. Imagine being raised by the four of them. Fred sighed wistfully. Was it as wonderful as it sounds? Only three, actually. Rigel was used to having to explain this. The marauder line bore a stylized M, W, P and P. Although Peter was no longer around, they left his moniker Wormtail on their products in tribute to the time of carefree joy that had inspired them. Peter Pettigrew, the fourth marauder, doesn't associate with the others any more. He joined the SOW party and decided he couldn't afford such juvenile friends. Their faces fell. A marauder in the cow party? Fred shook his head. For shame. Sow stood for Save Our World, and it was supposed to be pronounced like the sowing of seeds in a garden. Its opponents pronounced it like the barnyard animal, and often went further and called it by its old name, the Cure Our World Party. Cow and Sow were two iterations of the same conservative political movement currently headed by Lord Riddle. Its supporters believed the problems of modern wizarding society could be laid at the feet of undesirables and their corruptive influence on traditional red pureblood ideals. It was the Cow Party that first pushed for Hogwarts to close its doors to Muggleborns, citing security risks, but it was the Sow Party that had barred even half-bloods from attending. Rigel tried to bring the conversation back to more pleasant pastures. It really was wonderful, though, if you like waking up with purple scales where your hair used to be every now and then. Wicked, they breathed the word as one. I suppose, she said. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to mail a letter before breakfast. Not to worry, Slytherin puppy, Fred declared. For a confused moment, she wondered if he knew about Sirius Animagus' form, but Fred ploughed ahead as though the spontaneous nickname was inconsequential. We know the way, so we'll escort you. It's right through... He faltered and glanced up the passageway. Actually, the fastest way is up these stairs, so I'm guessing from your presence that you already knew that. He trailed off with a sheepish chuckle. George elbowed him in the side, as if the next generation marauder doesn't know his way around the castle. This pup was probably born with the sacred knowledge. Still, you couldn't ask for better company this fine morning, Fred said, taking one of her arms and looping it through his. He used significantly less finesse than Draco had the day before. George did the same on her other side, saying, Too true, brother mine. And it would be ever so irresponsible of us as Gryffindors to allow a baby snake to wander the nest unattended. Quite so, Fred agreed. Shall we? We shall. With that, the two redheads began towing her up the stairs, skipping over the trick step automatically and lifting her over it like a child between them. They chatted all the way to the owlery, prancing from topic to topic with the grace of a pair of fire dancers who had leapt over flames together all their lives. And don't even get me started on Percy. Fred shuddered dramatically. Ron's an all right sort for a hot headed git. Though he might not be so hot headed if we hadn't fed him so many pepper imps when he was little. George put in thoughtfully. But Percy is a rule lover. Fred whispered the term as though saying it aloud might breed more of them. Is he a red-headed prefect? Rigel asked. Oh, the shame. Fred put a hand to his temple. Trickster, help him he is. He did me a good turn on the train, Rigel said, thinking fast. Since he's your brother, he deserves proper thanks. Why don't you introduce me later? Fred and George turned their sharp eyes toward one another in a silent conference that reminded her a bit of Archie and herself. Rigel knew they were looking for the trick, the turn, the moment the joke becomes apparent and effective, the punchline. She also knew they wouldn't find it, because they didn't have all the pieces. Sure, we'll introduce you, Fred said slowly, though if you're planning to prank the poor sod, we insist that no permanent harm be done to him. He is our brother, after all. George was smiling, but there was marble in the firm tilt of his chin. Rigel made a note to not upset any of the other Weasleys. They had more protection than they probably realised. I just want to talk to him, Rigel said. It would be nice to have an older student to go to for advice, and he seems the type to enjoy giving it out. 
too true that, Fred said ruefully. Though, as older students full of excellent advice, we are dutifully offended, added George. Fred bowed grandly at the top of the outer stair. The owlery awaits, so we'll leave you to your business. Look us up after last period, and we'll introduce you to Perk. George winked over his shoulder. We'll be down by the lake with Lee. Rigel climbed the last few steps, pulling the letters she had to send from her pockets. The first one, to Draco's mother, was simple enough. Dear Lady Malfoy, thank you for the gracious invitation to watch this year's first Quidditch game with your family. I would be honoured to sit with you and your son, as long as it is no inconvenience. I look forward to being formally introduced. Yours sincerely, Arcturus Rigel Black. She rolled the letter carefully, ensuring the black family crest on the outside of the paper was visible, and tied it with a green ribbon to a young owl with gentle claws. "'Take this to Narcissa Malfoy,' she said softly. The owl flew gracefully through the window, and Rigel turned to the second letter. This one was significantly less formal, but much more complicated. She couldn't risk the letter being read by someone else, so she'd had to write it in a sort of code. "'Dear Harry, how are you? I miss you so, so much. And don't you dare roll your eyes at me. I know you secretly deep down miss me too. How are classes going? I'm sure you'll do great in the healing track. Just don't let it affect your potion studies, ha <laughs> ha, as if anything could. So guess who I ran into today? Marcus Flint. You know, the guy who always sits with me and Dad at the Quidditch games. Oh, wait, I never told you about him, did I? Oops, well, he's an old friend of mine, and I didn't expect to see him here at Hogwarts. We spent all yesterday catching up, and he remembers almost everything I've ever told him. Isn't that something? I felt bad that I couldn't say the same, but you know how terrible my memory is. You're always having to remind me of things. Anyway, classes are going well. I made a few friends with Draco Malfoy, of all people, if you can believe it, and Pansy Parkinson, as well as a few Weasleys. And, of course, there's Marcus. You know, I think you would like Marcus. He's really laid back for a fifth year, and definitely not the type to cause drama or trouble, just because he can. I think he prefers to settle his problems under the table. Ha <laughs> ha! And I know you always tell me I should be less dramatic and just deal with things. Perhaps Marcus will help me get better at that. Maybe I'll introduce you this summer, and the two of you can write while we're at school. I worry about you all the way in America by yourself. Anyway, I hope you're well. Your cousin, Rigel P.S. I'm not going by Archie here at school. I think it's time I took a more mature name, so I've been using my middle name. What do you think? Maybe I'll go back to being Archie some day, but for now it's just Rigel. There. She rolled the second letter and sent it off with a screech owl, another kind of code between the two of them. Sending a letter with a screech owl meant it was important, but still safe to read around others. A barn owl meant nothing important, just general news, and an eagle owl meant an emergency. It wasn't terribly subtle, but at least she had warned him that Flint was here, that he recognised her as not Archie, and that they had struck a deal. She'd all but told him to write Flint himself and pressed him to remind her of any other things she was supposed to remember about Archie's life that they hadn't already covered. She hoped he really wouldn't slack too much in potions. It would be a dead giveaway to their parents when they saw grade reports, and it would detract from the credibility of Harry Potter, the potions mistress, later on. She would have to pretend an interest in healing while she was at Hogwarts, but they didn't even have it as an option until third year. The sun was already up and climbing, so Rigel hurried down to breakfast. Draco and Pansy were discussing their herbology assignment, which Rigel had put off a little late and was planning on finishing during lunch. When the post came, she looked up automatically, but she was still surprised to see two owls swoop down onto her breakfast and thrust their legs at her. One she recognised. It was Uncle Sirius's tawny owl. It had a permanently rumpled look that Rigel thought Sirius had chosen it for. Before they'd left home, she and Archie had had to bribe the family owls for weeks to convince them to bring their letters to one another. Even with address charms on the envelopes, owls were much cleverer than most people gave them credit for. It was only after many failed attempts at addressing letters to one another falsely that they realised the owls took bribes in the form of regular treats. She took Sirius's letter and waved ruffles graciously toward the platter of bacon, then turned to the other owl. It was a common school owl, and when she peeked inside the letter, she understood why. It was from Flint. That was fast. She resisted the urge to look over at Flint damningly, 
and stowed his letter in her pocket to read later. She unfolded the first letter instead. "'Archie, how are you? You sounded good in your letter, but then I've never known you to not sound good. Not that I could actually hear your letter as sound, of course. I just meant that you write with a very strong voice. Mooney says I'm rambling, but what does he know? Anyway, glad things are going so well, son. I know you wanted to go to a school with a better healing programme, but your experience at Hogwarts will far outweigh any head start on your adult career. Don't be in such a hurry to grow up. So have you pranked anyone yet? That defence professor sounds like a perfect trial target. Or maybe one of those snake roommates of yours. No, I'm not disappointed about your house. And I'm not just saying that because Mooney is hitting me for making cracks at your new friends. Ouch! He's got quite a swat arm, Mooney. Almost as good as Lily's. Ouch! OK, so I deserved that. Anyway, Arch, I should have known you'd be a Slytherin with all that ambition to be a healer. Of course, that's honest ambition, not really Slytherin ambition, but the hat probably can't tell the difference. But if you're going to be a Slytherin, you're going to have to go all the way with it. No half-baked Slytherins in our family... I've redecorated the entire house in green and silver, and I expect you to try out for your house Quidditch team, if only to make up for the fact that Harry can't. James says she doesn't think she'll have time to join an intramural, since she'll be doing boring stuff like studying instead. I know what a waste of talent. I've asked Dumbledore if I can come watch a few matches for old time's sake, but the Board of Governors has recently changed the rules in the interest of security. Allegedly, James says it's codswallop. But parents can't come watch the games any more. It's apparently only students, staff and Board of Governors members. How convenient. So I won't get to see you play, but you can still tell me all about it in loving detail. Mooney wants to write now, so have fun and don't work too hard or I'll send you a howler full of embarrassing stories. Love, Dad. Hey, Archie, it's Remus. How's school? I hope you don't think your father is serious. No, not that joke again, when he says not to focus on your studies. You should, of course, have fun, and trying out for Quidditch is a great idea, but learn a lot, too, so you can achieve the ambition that got you into Slytherin House. We wouldn't want all this green and silver tinsel to go to waste. I'm afraid I'm not joking. There are dancing snakes in the courtyard. Hurry home for Christmas break and control your father. Love, Uncle Remus. Rigel smiled and shook her head. She wondered if Sirius had noted her used of the dicto quill in her letter and responded in kind to be cheeky. She liked to think she was better as controlling her stream of thoughts than he and Remus were. The asides and parenthetical clauses were difficult to follow with just the basic grammar charms built into the quill. Her smile faded as she tucked the letter into her book bag. It wasn't fair to Sirius what they were doing. It wasn't fair to James and Lily either, but Sirius was the one who had only recently climbed out of the dark pool he'd sunk himself in after Diane's tragic passing. It was equally tragic that, just as Sirius regained his footing, playing pranks again, expressing interest in Quidditch matches, Archie and Harry had ripped it out from under him. She knew she had a responsibility, as Archie, to help Sirius continue to recover. It sat awkwardly in her stomach, a burden she had never expected to carry, but it was hers now for better or worse. She prayed it wasn't for worse. After breakfast, they had their first practical potions lesson. Rigel flipped through the book as they waited for class to start, daydreaming about which one they would be brewing first. After his speech the day before, she half hoped Snape would dispense with the book altogether and teach them something completely unexpected. As the bell rang, however, Snape waved his wand at the blackboard and a spidery hand scrawled the recipe for a boil cure, along with a page number for where it could be found in their textbook. Rigel's heart fell back into a normal rhythm as she realised they would be starting with potions that were little more than herbal remedies. She only hoped they moved quickly onto the more fascinating concoctions. She had been waiting to try things like polyjuice, amatentia, and wolfsbane, partially because the ingredients were so expensive, and mostly because such potions were dangerous to brew outside of a classroom without a licence. Slowly and fluidly, she set up her brewing station. The boil cure potion wouldn't take long to make, and she wasn't in any hurry to get started. She wanted to savour the experience, her first potion under proper instruction. She stowed her textbook safely away before unpacking her student potions kit. It was basic, but it held all the ingredients required for a potion like this. She wouldn't get to explore the student storeroom that day, but she comforted herself with the idea that they wouldn't have a student storeroom if they weren't going to eventually brew much more difficult potions. 
Snape lit the flames at every station simultaneously, and Rigel carefully settled her cauldron and waited for the entire bottom to get hot before adding the first ingredients, the wet ones that would form the base. There were no tricks to this potion. It was a simple add and stir, with a few extra steps for filtering and reheating. She glanced at the other students while she stirred, counting first clockwise and then counterclockwise in her head. Crab was squinting hopelessly at the blackboard, not seeming to realise the recipe was duplicated in his book. Not was enthusiastically, if barbarically, chopping his dandelion roots. She could see the ragged edges from her own table. The fraying strands would catch the frog spores and prevent them from dissolving as they should. When the roots were strained, the soothing spores would be strained out as well, and his potion would be too acidic to use on human skin. Rigel wondered if his knife was just exceedingly dull. She had a set of beautiful platinum knives that Remus, Lily and Archie had all chipped in to get her for her tenth birthday. Less reactive than silver, with an edge that would remain spell-sharp for years. The basic silver-lined steel that came with the first-year kit probably couldn't replicate her precise cuts. Across the room, a girl in a Gryffindor tie dangled her long hair into her cauldron every time she leaned forward to check her potion's consistency. This particular potion would not react badly to such treatment, aside from making her hair smell like swamp gas for the rest of the day, but it was poor sanitation practice all the same. Rigel took a moment to appreciate her short hair. She had been reluctant to sacrifice her curly locks as first, but it did make for much easier brewing. Rigel could understand why Snape began with such a boring potion if this was what he had to work with. At a school that didn't even admit Muggleborns, it was astonishing that most of the students lacked even the most basic concepts of brewing safety and technique. They had magical parents for Merlin's sake. Potions was one of the few branches of magic you could teach a kid before they had a wand, and she knew for a fact her classmates had tutors in magical history and the basics of self-defence. She shook her head in bewilderment as she took her potion off the fire. Some people just had no appreciation for the art. She added the porcupine quills when her brew was sufficiently cooled. The instructions were very specific on that point, and she had learned the hard way how porcupine quills reacted to heat. The black mark where her cauldron had been still marred their living room rug. She was given permission to brew in her mother's basement lab with its built-in safety spells shortly thereafter. With at least half an hour of their block period to spare, Rigel bottled her sample and cleared her space. She had taken her time and thought most people ought to be bottling by now, but only Draco and Goyle had reached the same stage. She eyed Goyle's work and thought it was less that he'd finished his potion and more that his potion was simply finished. It looked like black tar congealing in the bottom of his cauldron, but he was gamely scraping some out and into a vial, so that was something. Draco was yawning dramatically beside his finished sample, which would probably work as a boil cure if whoever used it didn't get so nauseated from inhaling the undercooked dilly sprout fumes that they couldn't apply it properly. She supposed he may well gloat, since he had still done better than most. Pansy was glaring at her potion, which was a cheerful yellow soup when it was supposed to be a dark green paste. Rigel thought she'd probably skipped adding the knotgrass entirely. Knotgrass was a thickening agent, and green enough to be responsible for the final ideal colour. Neville's potion wasn't too bad, just off-colour and emitting faint brown smoke. He'd probably just gotten nervous and lost count of his counterclockwise stirring. She and Draco packed up their station and took their samples to Snape's desk. The professor had spent the lesson carefully observing his students, like a bird of prey. He circled any who appeared weak, but instead of death he delivered salvation when he swooped down on them. Snape had already prevented several explosions involving mishandled porcupine quills. His sharp eyes cut their way as they dropped off the samples, and he nodded curtly before turning his attention back to those still working. He seemed tense, and Rigel didn't blame him. Imagine being responsible for the safety of two dozen eleven-year-olds who hadn't the good sense to keep from trailing their sleeves through their ingredient piles. What did he see when he watched them brew? And was it disappointing? Rigel had often wondered why a man with enough ideas to churn out a major article for publication every two years or so would choose to teach schoolchildren at Hogwarts. 
Observing him now, she did not get the feeling he enjoyed the act of teaching for its own sake. Perhaps she was being unfair, however. It was only their first lesson. His older students, who had been with him six or seven years, must give him more satisfaction. If they did not, Rigel vowed that she would make up for it in her time at Hogwarts. She would be the best student he had ever taught. She would show him his efforts were not wasted. When you are finished, you may get started on an eight-inch essay regarding the safety precautions one should take while working with such things as volatile ingredients, open flames and sharp cutting implements. Snape barked loudly. Due Monday! Nobody dared to groan. Rigel took out a fresh roll of parchment and began her essay. Draco glanced at her paper several times from the corner of his eye, and she bore it patiently. If he had a question, he would ask. Sure enough, when she started a new paragraph, he whispered, You didn't even make an outline. Are you going to write the whole thing from memory? She nodded, mentally organising her points as she worked. It would be more instructive to write the essay in chronological order of the safety precautions one should take from beginning to end, instead of grouping them by the danger they prevented or combated. Draco hummed disbelievingly. What are you putting for the flames, then? It's not as though you can use a flame-freezing charm if you want the potion to work. You should start by securing all loose articles of clothing. Sleeves should be rolled, hair tied back, that sort of thing. Then you should clear away unnecessary materials. None of the potion's ingredients are wrapped in paper for a reason. Glass jars and metal containers are resistant to heat. But if your textbook is on the table by the flame and someone walks by and bumps your station, it could catch fire. That's why Professor Snape puts the recipe on the board, even though it's also in the book. She spoke absently while considering the merits of using built-in fumigation spells when working with certain ingredients. That enough to start? Thanks. Draco shook his head ruefully. I never would have guessed so much thought went into all this. Seventy percent of all serious magical accidents involve potions, not including flying accidents. Rigel said seriously. There's an entire specialised field in potions that deals with improving safety in the lab and educating people about the dangers of certain ingredients and tools. You're a potions encyclopaedia, Rigel, Pansy said quietly as she pulled up a chair. She had a fresh sheet of parchment to start her essay and a frown that said she was not satisfied with how her potion had turned out at all. Rigel shrugged. She had always liked potions, had been reading potions quarterly since she'd realised other people liked potions too, so of course she had a working knowledge of the subject. Snape is sure to notice eventually, Draco whispered reassuringly. He's always really busy at the start of term. I used to never see him from August to October. I bet after Halloween he'll pay more attention to those who are doing well in his class. If he doesn't, I'll just have to try harder. Rigel brought one corner of her mouth up in a half-smile. Or you could just tell him your ambitions. Draco raised his eyebrows. He was serious in his start-of-term speech. Snape takes really good care of his Slytherins. All you have to do is ask, and he'll do almost anything for one of his snakes. Where's the fun in that? She asked as she measured the inches she had written. I can't tell if he's serious, Pansy said ruefully. Sirius would be pleased to know I was mistaken for him, she thought wryly, but she wasn't serious, not really. "'Snape might be willing to extend favours to the others, "'but for the son of Sirius Black? "'No, she didn't think so. "'Rigel would have to prove that she was worth his time and effort. "'She had eight and three-quarter inches of medium-small writing. "'Not exactly eight, which would indicate she gave up the essay as soon as she could, "'but not an entire inch longer, "'which might suggest she didn't respect his requirements. "'The bell rang as she was brushing the drying sand off her essay.' She rolled it up and waved Draco and Pansy to go ahead of her. The rest of the class filed out, shoulders slumped as though they had just undergone the defining tribulation of their short lives, and Rigel waited to see whether Snape immediately left as well. He was making short work of tidying the classroom, so she approached him. He had his back to her, wiping the blackboard clean with his wand when she cleared her throat quietly. Snape turned his head sharply, nostrils flared, and Rigel was struck with the knowledge that his immediate response to surprise was to locate the source and supply oxygen to his brain for quick thinking. Upon identifying her, his face assumed a blank expression, and he lowered his wand carefully, as if he had to think about leaving himself open to attack around a student. 
Rigel had the sudden, ironic hope that her short hair and grey eyes didn't make her look too much like Sirius, no matter that that had been her original intention. Mr. Black. Snape looked down his prominent nose at her, his voice studiously inflectionless. They were back to neutrality then. Do you have a question about the lesson or essay? No, sir. She said it deferentially, keeping her hands still and her eyes at a level just below his. I've finished my essay, and I was wondering if you would mind giving me an additional assignment for the weekend. She dared to meet his eyes for a moment, but found only fathoms in their depths. I would, of course, understand if you had no time to grade a second essay. Merlin forbid he think her presumptuous with his time. He blinked hard once, and lowered his chin to catch her eye directly. Extra work won't gain you extra credit? It would be factored into your grade as if it were required, and do not make the mistake of believing that doing twice as much means you can work half as diligently on each. Of course, sir. She kept his gaze, willing him to take a chance on her. He looked away first, turning his gaze to the group of samples on his desk, searching until his eyes came to rest on the one labelled Black. Snape pursed his lips at the innocuous vial of green paste. Give me the essay I have already assigned. If I find that it is neither rushed nor hopelessly inaccurate, I will consider giving you an additional assignment. He held out his hand for her scroll, which she relinquished. Come to my office after dinner to either collect this essay for revision or receive more work. Yes, sir. She bobbed her head in a nod that somehow came out as an awkward half-bow. Her cheeks flushed. I thank you. Don't thank me yet, Mr. Black.' 